wrote to Prime Minister Liz Truss in an attempt to block her son's killer from being granted parole. There's a lot to this particular story, OK, because Venables has actually re-offended twice since being convicted of the two-year-old's murder in 1993. The parole board is preparing to decide whether to release Venables from prison. A bit of context again about some of his re-offending there. It's child porn related, so you've got the fact that he's not only a child murderer, also clearly has some kind of weird sexual fascination with children as well. He's committed those crimes whilst on parole, so he must have known that people were looking at his computer, seemingly didn't particularly care as well. Taxpayers' expense for a new identity potentially every single time. It's got a lot to it, this, people, and a lot of you have been getting in touch, gbviews at gbnews.uk throughout on that. We'll go to those shortly, but to discuss this now, it's my pleasure to be joined by former Scotland Yard detective Peter Blacksey. Peter, how are you? Very well, thank you. I also believe I've got criminal barrister Chris Dorr as well, I believe, down the line, I think. Chris will emerge at some point. There we go, both of you. Um, OK, right, so, Peter, I'll start with you. I'm getting a lot of emails from people in this say, this chap can never be rehabilitated. If he's allowed out on the streets, there'll be riots. Utterly understandable sentiments. Completely understandable. Because what do we know about Venables? Proven to be dangerous, mm. proven to be deviant. Mm. Well, parole board, would you like to set him free? Do yeah. you want to put him out on the streets to potentially offend again? Mm. It's shocking stuff, isn't it? And Chris, criminal barrister Chris Dorr, uh, this is unbelievable as far as I can see. Not just because of, but I can't believe I'm about to say this phrase, not just because of the initial murder of a toddler, right, but then the subsequent child porn offences as well. Uh, this guy should never see the light of day again, should he? Oh. oh, I think you're on mute, Chris. Sorry, Chris, you're on mute, I'm afraid. Yeah, there he is. Sorry about that. Um, you know, no, what I was right saying on. was, uh, whether he should be released or whether he should see the light of day, as you call it, it depends entirely on whether he remains a danger to the public, which is exactly what the parole board are there to decide. Um, if the parole board consider, they'll consider everything. They'll consider, of course, the original offence committed when he was only 10 years old, and they'll con consider the child sex, uh, uh, the uh, pornography offences for which he's subsequently been recalled and arrested and even sentenced. And they'll consider, probably uh, alongside all of that, they'll consider psychological, psychiatric assessments, his prison records and his behaviour in prison, and they'll make an overall assessment as to whether he remains okay. a risk to the public. If he is, he'll remain in prison. If he's not, Chris, I'll just, uh, I'll, he just sit with you, I'll just sit with you before I throw it back over to Peter, because as a criminal barrister, I wonder how would you personally feel if a death penalty was at play in your profession? Would you feel comfortable with a legal system that had the death penalty? No, to totally not, because I've been involved in cases where people have been wrongly convicted of murder, including three black men who were convicted of a murderer in the early 1990s of a woman called Lynette White, who was subsequently freed many years later on appeal. And it turned out that the murder was committed by a white man on DNA evidence. And uh, if we had the death penalty, those three black men would have been hanged and so, or, or electrocuted yeah. or poisoned or whatever it would be. Yeah. So, yeah. of course not. We can't have the death penalty in a civilised country. It's, it's the, the risk of killing innocent people is far too high. And the evidence is that the death penalty is counterproductive and actually doesn't reduce crime at all. Peter, how do you feel? Because as a former Scotland Yard detective, I mean, you might have ended up having to arrest this guy a couple of times, for example. It must be a bit soul-destroying in that regard. But, I don't know, on, on a personal note, how, how do you feel about, about the death penalty? Well, firstly, as a detective, mm. you have to be pragmatic. So when you arrest people, whether they be murderers or somebody that's a robber or a burglar, at the end of the day, you gather the evidence... Mm give it to the CPS and, and you have to kind of park it because sometimes you get perverse verdicts and all, all manner of things. So be pragmatic, do your job. Personally, mm. I remember not so long ago there was a certain Home Secretary that was talking about three strikes and you're out, mm. or actually three strikes and you're going to be in. Some could argue that Mr Venables has hit that three strikes bar and therefore he should not be released. I'd love to have all the information in front of me yeah. that the parole board have got, but we can only go by what we're told. I would think very, very long and hard about letting this man out onto the streets of Britain. Yeah, I I indeed. And there are layers to it. Chris, can you just tell me a little bit about how the parole board actually works? Because we've had numerous situations recently. There was the John Warboys stuff. I mean, to be fair, we hear about the ones that you could argue they get wrong. I mean, Colin Pitchfork as well, I think, was... Pretty dodgy, to be honest with you. It was, really, wasn't it? Because he got recalled. But how does the parole board actually work? Because there's a, there, there, there is potentially a misconception. Some people think there's a, they're a bit of a, 
a, a, a shadowy group of people. They're not actually that shadowy if you look into them, but that, that make decisions that won't affect their lives, but might affect my life because this guy might come and move in next door to me. Well, that's true of a jury who decides whether someone's guilty of a crime in the first place. Um, it's, it's true of the judge who decides what sentence to impose. The parole board's role is very straightforward. Um, the parole board is a, is a public body. Uh, its members are uh, publicly known, as you've just pointed out. Uh, they're made up of people from a, a range of backgrounds, uh, lawyers, uh, uh, former judges, and a variety of other uh, are people with experience and expertise in criminal justice and, and, and psychology and, and, and all of the other elements that go into the decision. But the simple process is this. The parole board looks at all of the evidence about this person, and it's an extensive range of evidence, as I said earlier, involving all sorts of medical, psychiatric and other assessments, as well as all of the prison records and all of the criminal records and everything else. And the parole board really has to make one decision. And it's not made by a single person. It's made by a group of members of the parole board. And that decision is, is this person a risk to the public? Do they, does this person pose a risk to the public? If the evidence causes them to the conclusion that the person remains a risk to the public, parole is refused. And I should tell you this, that whatever the parole board's decision, it can be challenged in the High Court by the Justice Secretary, by members of the public or anyone else, and a High Court judge will then review the decision very carefully and has the power to quash the parole board's decision, uh, whether it be to release or not to release. So there's, there are many, many layers before a decision is made to release someone on parole, and all of those decisions can be challenged in court. Yeah, uh, Peter, how do you feel about the fact that s s cases like this, in my opinion, make it very easy to go, we're too soft, we're far too soft here, you know. We've got a guy here who's killed a toddler, sickly, OK, he was a child at the time, right, but then he's gone on to commit two crimes also involving children. We can't chemically castrate the guy, apparently, we can't kill him, so, you know, what's the best thing to do now? Just lock him up forever? That seems to be tricky, he's got a parole hearing. Do you think we are too soft on some of these people? Well, the parole board has made pretty catastrophic mistakes, as you rightly point out, most notably and most recently, of course, Colin Pitchfork. Yeah. Let's remember, some of these prisoners who are incarcerated for years are very, very deceitful and dangerous people. They plot and they hatch and they hoodwink mm. and they, they are able to completely fool people into thinking that they are safe to be released. So to answer your question, yeah. please, if I may briefly, yeah, yeah. prevention is better than cure. Very quickly, sorry, I'm going to get shouted out very quickly. How much does it cost to give someone a new identity, roughly, do you know? Fortunes. I wouldn't know now, no, but, but when I was given a new identity and placed in witness protection, it cost tens upon tens of thousands of pounds. Good grief. Well, cost of living crisis or why.